Okay, well, I'm Matthew Woolard. Uh, as Brigitte has said, I'm the director of the UK Data Archive. And the UK Data Archive is uh, a subject-specific digital archive. Um, we deal with uh, social and economic data in the main. Um, and the organization has been uh, running now for 45 years. Uh, we were set up in 1967. And this is uh, really not particularly about legal or ethical issues. It is about, it is a, really a use case of how we've um, implemented digital object identifiers uh, within the UK Data Archive, um, how we've uh, interacted with data site, um, and um, some ideas about how we might be able to move some of these uh, initiatives forward in the future, and how we might do that um, with members of data site. So, and I have to say that this is a presentation which I, I have given once before in a, in a very near variant to this um, at a workshop on persistent identifiers in Berlin last month. It is up to date, and I have tweaked it for this uh, conference, um, but there are still some broad messages in here which I'm pretty certain that everyone is going to be, um, is, is going to be aware of. I like to think about the reasons behind citing data. It goes back to the, why do you, why do you try and measure impact? Why do you need to cite data? Um, and I think that these uh, six reasons here, including helping tracking the impact and use of data collections, um, are the key drivers, at least within the social sciences. Um, and I think every presentation you hear about data citation or data site or digital object identifiers, these five or six, these six um, reasons are usually brought to the fore um, in different orders, uh, different rankings. Um, but I think that it's really important that we do continue to recognize some of these principles. It's about the sources, it's about credit, it's about replication, um, it's about impact, it's about reliable information about the data. But also, as Andrew's pointed out very clearly this morning, it really helps also to find and access data. So it's another process of finding it. Now this is um, our approach to citation uh, in the past. Um, you don't, you're not supposed to be able to read it if you can read it. Um, your glasses or your contact lenses are, are much too uh, well focused. Um, we have an end user agreement with our users. When users come to us and they take our data, they have to click on the bottom of this. Uh, it's, not, it's not as big as your, you know, updating your Mac operating system, I agree. Um, but it is quite long. And tucked in here, it, is, it says to acknowledge any publication, whether printed, electronic, or broadcast. You can see a lawyer's been involved in this. How, how's a broadcast of some data? Anyway, based wholly or in part of data collections, the archaeology data service have once had some of their data used in a performance piece. So it's, it is possible. Um, and then underneath that, it says uh, to supply the relevant data service provider, that's us, uh, with bibliographic details of any published work based wholly or in part on the data collections. This is the old style, but this is still within our end user agreement. And our approach to citation is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, it should provide enough information to ensure that the exact uh, version can be found. This, you can see it says in here, second edition. Um, but it, and this has been the way in which we've asked people to cite data uh, since the mid-70s or so. And it's not an acknowledgement. This is a citation. We don't like people who cite data. I'd like to thank my friend, Professor X, for letting me use his data. And I do have examples of this, um, and I've forgotten to bring them with me. Um, but it's not an acknowledgement. We want people to cite data. So obviously, we think, and we wouldn't be here otherwise, I wouldn't be here otherwise, uh, we think that the use of persistent identifiers for data um, should be similar to those that are used for other research outputs. And we take these two terms and break them down, persistent and identifiers. 
and we want to make sure that we're actually doing what it is that those things highlight. Persistence must mean enduring, perhaps not for all eternity, but for a very long time and at some stage in the future that we can't necessarily comprehend. And identifiers must be unique. It sounds pretty straightforward. In the case of a persistent identifier, it should be unique. It sounds pretty straightforward, but it's not actually always put into practice when you're thinking about the citation and the allocation of persistent identifiers to stuff. And I think also the other area that we've had to think about a lot is about the fact that the digital object, whatever it is that is being cited, needs to be clearly defined in order to ensure that the appropriate granularity of that object identifier being given to it. And as we heard this morning, this is not just about citing data or citing research outputs. Persistent identifiers of a sort can be used to identify individuals, researchers, taxonomies, all sorts of other things as well. And it's not to think this is only going to be of use for research outputs of one sort or another. So we went through a reasonably long process in order to try and implement digital object identifiers because our data collections in themselves aren't just digital objects. They're collections of digital objects, but they may, and many of the older ones include, there are still physical, uh, there, there are still physical manifestations of, of code books in paper. Not all of them have been digitized. We also, because we, because we run an organization that is making data available in a usable form to the end user, we make changes to data. And this can happen quite frequently. It's not just on the ingest process when we discover that a statistical organization within the UK has given us some personally identifying information that we should leave out of these data. So we would remove it. So the data has changed. The persistent identifier is no longer persistent. We have to think about the way in which data is versioned, and we need to try and do this in a commonly understood manner, which deals not only with editorial changes, but also uh, with changes in terms of a longitudinal uh, data, a data collection exercise, where data is added in waves to data sets over time. We wanted to make sure that our understanding of versioning was rule-based, but human-mediated, so that we could have a little bit of flexibility over what a significant or a high-impact change was. And we also wanted to make sure that we were able to implement some of these things in a machine-actionable way, because the huge cost of digital preservation of data archiving um, is human. And wherever we can get humans out of the workflow or reduce them in the workflow, the better it is. So we wanted to integrate the processes with digital preservation activities, but we also wanted to make sure that they worked within our current infrastructure and workflows, and we wanted to get it right first time. So this is, this is important. Around 15% of things we ingest in any given year, and that's about 200 data collections every year, about 15% of them are changed within the first year. Some of them are new additions, uh, where there are these types of changes. Did I miss a slide? No. Some of them are, are um, new additions, but there are also changes to underlying metadata, um, which are slightly lower impact change. So, what we've done is we've said we've got high impact changes and we've got low impact changes. And we also recognize that social science users, the majority, I say the majority of social science users want the most recent version. They don't want the old version. Most social, science, most social sciences are not using data to replicate or validate other people's research. They're using it for their own research. So we made the decision that the users will have older versions made available to them. Um, 
and information about those older versions should be, um, should be available, but they have to demand it. And in most cases, we can go back through our systems and take older versions, but we can't make them available to the user on demand. And then we've got this raft of low impact uh, changes, a, a change in a reference, the, the spelling of a variable, uh, the removal of administrative information, metadata spelling corrections, adding index terms, adding documentation, adding changes or making a change to access conditions. I should say that we're getting towards 10% of our collection now is in some way, in some way restricted um, at a sensitive level. We're holding sensitive data for government. And about 60% of it has another access condition on it, which means that you can't just come along and take it away. So about 30% of our collection is open to anyone on registration, but, but a considerable proportion has an access condition that means you can't just come along and take it. And then we decided to codify some of the high impacts, and you'll see that new variables, new codes, new weighting, uh, data which was miscoded, changes in file formats, significant, and again, this is a problematic word, what do we mean, can we measure significant, but significant changes in documentation and change in access conditions. If it's a change in access conditions from closed to open, then that's a minor change. If it's a change from restricted, from, from open to restricted, that's a major change. And what we did is we started to take these, uh, take these ideas and turn them into uh, a, a straightforward workflow. And we decided that we would think about instances. And you can see that we have three different types of change. Um, we have an internal change during the ingest process, which is something that we do, nobody knows about, um, but it's not released publicly. That's an internal instance. If there's a low impact change, then we have a new external instance with the same persistent identifier. And if we have a high impact change, we have a new external instance and a new persistent identifier. So that's the methodology. And then you all know about DataSite. Um, but last year, we started working with the British Library and DataSite to try and allocate digital object identifiers to our 6,000 odd collections. Um, and that's, you know, you know the rest of that. And in discussion with DataSite and the British Library, we came to the opinion that it would be better to allocate the identifier to core metadata. Uh, we originally thought it would be better to allocate it to uh, core metadata, but even the titles of some of our studies change. Uh, adding a new wave to a longitudinal survey, there's a new title, for goodness sake, so that's not persistent enough. For... So we did work on this basis of allocating a, a, a DOI to the metadata, which relates to each external instance, and I described those a moment ago, of the data collection. And the digital object identifiers resolve to a jump page, uh, which points to all of the external instances. And that should look like this. So this is time period one. User comes in. They're looking at the survey. Survey waves 1 to 13. It has a digital object identifier, which shows the study number, which is our collection study number. And that points to instance-specific data and metadata. The user comes in at time period two. The DOI has changed, the title has changed, and there's a pointer still to the new current instance-specific data and metadata. And if we just go uh, to the current time, uh, and if user comes at time period three, then the instance-specific data and metadata is live for that, but only for that time period. So the user sees the other stuff, but they don't be, they're not able to get the data uh, from the earlier versions. Um, and that's what it looks like in our catalog. Uh, reasonably straightforward, there's the citation, uh, and 
this is version two of a data set. And in fact, it's not version two because it's version 12, but it's version 12, the second new version since DOIs were introduced. Um, and then there's version three above. And on the right-hand side, there would be a pointer to the, to the catalog record where the user would be able uh, to get hold of the data. So the process that we went through, and there was a question this morning about, well, you know, how, do you, how do you actually do this? Well, it's these six or seven steps um, that are needed, that we need to do. Uh, we mint a new DOI through DataCite. We update the change log within our systems. We create a new citation file that zips into the catalog. Um, Bob's your uncle. Um, if we have to update the catalog record, it's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit trickier because we have to keep the old catalog record as a record of what uh, was present in the past. And since these things are, are not entirely, um, not always entirely clear to everybody, um, and there isn't actually a lot to be said um, about what you should be putting after your publishers your publishers slash, um, we thought that we would keep an archive readable identifier, the UKDA, uh, within, within the, um, the DOI. We're putting in SN, and for me, I know that that means study number, but it means that we could reuse or use very similar numbers also to define things at a sub-collection level. So study number one, is pointing to a metadata instance. When we get to the stage of using digital object identifiers to point to the data set or versions of data set, we can still use this sequence and this hierarchy of, of, um, of format. Um, and, well, we, again, we've seen that this morning. This is a hugely helpful and hugely useful um, thing that, uh, that DataCite have provided. Um, it allows us to be able to see a little bit about how people are coming to us and whether they're coming to us through, through DataCite. Am I going to skip that one? So measuring impact uh, and the impact of research was the topic of the keynote this morning. And what really interested me, or what really interests me, is how do we manage to assess in any way the impact of the service that we're running. How are people using the data um, that we are providing access to? Because we're not really carrying out research. We are, we are infrastructure. But our research councils treat us a little bit as though we are research, because they're not always sure precisely what the difference is. And this is a, a relatively straightforward example just of using Google to be able to look at how our data has been cited um, by others and available um, on the internet. But Google is a bit of a, uh, a hard tool, and I'd like to find much better ways of assessing how the DOIs that we issue, which cite data which we hold, um, are used because then we can start to have a look at some of the impact that we're having as a service. We can start running some of the bibliometrics on, on this, because this is the only evidence that we have, um, really now the only evidence that we have. As I said, if you expect researchers to cite data properly, we should be able not just to mine these DOIs from uh, the open internet, but also from some of the the, the deeper and more closed parts of the internet. This is another initiative where we'd like to work uh, with some publishers on. So our challenges for the future um, are looking at lower levels of granularity of data, uh, especially about subsets of individual files. Again, we're currently only pointing to metadata. We don't even point to a data set. Um, but subsets of quantitative data are increasingly important, especially this figure here is the GDP of Guyana in 1976. 
that's an identifiable data point held in macro data, you should be able to cite it. It shouldn't just be 4.6 or whatever the number is. You should be able to cite down at a cell level in a database. We also want to make sure that there are clearer, clearer relationships between different types of object. And again, I'm really pleased to see the, the uh, announcement from DataCide, um, which includes some of these issues, movements towards some of these issues, having better relationships between research articles, which are held by publishers or in institutional repositories, and research inputs for data. But data is also a research output as well. Um, and we need to make sure that research outputs, which are data, are related to other research outputs, which are data, especially as we've moved more to a reuse culture where people should be rewarded for reuse rather than just rewarded for creation. The relationship between two data sets, because they're so easy to manipulate, I can take somebody else's data, I can add another variable to it, I can publish it. Well, I shouldn't get credit for the whole thing. So we need to make sure that that interrelationship between owner and creator and distributor is a little bit more sorted out. And also for our research councils, we want to try and find a way of making sure that outputs and researchers are better linked together because there are too many, there's, there are too many researchers on this planet to effectively disambiguate them uh, manually. So one of the challenges for the future, and this is, this is touching on the idea that Andrew, or the implementation that Andrew was talking about uh, this morning, and we feel that as we're moving in the UK into a culture where, the, where austerity is important um, and the cost of looking after data um, is, in, is increasing because there is more human effort involved, we can still look after tons and tons of stuff. It's not the volume in terms of the size of the, the, the bits of data. It is the human activity for checking. So we're trying to move towards a model, and it's a bit contradictory to the one that EFCA pr uh, presented in the previous session. We want to see institutional repositories doing more. We know that they're not very good at it at the moment, but they will improve. Um, they will improve over time. Um, and we think that not only can they look after the journals, but they can also look after the data. Now, I'm not saying that the institutional repositories should be looking after data for 50 or 100 years, but they should be the, the ground where they can be placed to be looked after rather than curated, looked after, backed up for 10 or 15 years so that something like the... Uh, the, the data use index we heard about this morning can be applied to that. And we can say, well, these are the top 50, 100,000 data collections which were used in the last decade. Let's move those into the specialist data repository, use the institutional repositories as some form of selection process. But that's for the future. And in the meantime, we still, as, as a specialist data archive, we still need to be able to find or, or let our users find more data. And the solution, again, that Andrew provides of going through data site, and then possibly we could go to um, the, the Australian National Library's digital, and possibly, well, I don't like the idea, neither does he, of the 150 things going down the side of the page. So I do think that using a single API to interact with either a metadata store or with an institutional repository probably isn't going to be effective. We need to try and drag some of the data out of these things, put it centrally, and then attack that data. And that's going to, in real time, that's going to be really, really difficult. But it's not an impossibility, and it depends how frequently uh, data changes um, and I think that users are probably going to be happy with today rather than this second. But we never know. Uh, and I think, sorry, I just think that digital object identifiers can provide some of the glue which hold this as a model together because there's the relationship between research outputs 
and data um, being stored in all of the different uh, in all of the different repositories. So the point here is that at some stage in the future, we need a way of referring one digital object identifier or one URL to another in a reasonably permanent way. I think the other thing that we might need to think about in the future, and Akim Wakaro gave a presentation at this meeting uh, last month, he said um, a program is as likely to follow a URL as a person, and I don't think he's right. Um, I think a program is much more likely to follow a URL than a person. So it posed the question, and he asked it, and we, didn't re we did have a discussion, but we didn't get much towards an answer. Is there a specific property missing from, from data site? And if there were one specific property missing at the moment, which we as data archivists, um, I think, would like to be able to add, is the rich metadata, a pointer to rich metadata and a pointer to rich and, and, and a description of the rich metadata identifier. So in my case, this would have uh, a URL um, or, a, or in fact even a persistent identifier which would go to my catalog record or an OAI version of my catalog record and the rich metadata schema would say DDI and a machine would be able to whip through data sites catalog and rather than as Andrew's solution this morning was to search on title, they'd be able to search on the whole of the metadata records. Now our metadata records are handcrafted. They take days to produce. There are tens of thousands of words in some of them. It would be nice to search all of those through a single portal. One minute on raising awareness. We've been trying to do a lot of raising awareness within the UK on this. I've put on your tables a brochure, which, which is called um, Data Citation. Um, what else would it be called? What you need to know. What you need to know. And, it's, and it's very short. Um, and this is, and it, well, it has sort of pictures. Um, it's not branded by my organization. Uh, it's branded by the Research Council. Um, and they did a very fine job on reusing some illustrations because this is the same illustration they use on the front of their big, glossy, how to do impact journal uh, brochure. Um, so the SRC have been uh, really good in helping us with this and DataCite and the British Library and others um, have been really good in making sure that they've endorsed it. So hopefully it is all correct and it is what you need to know. I just want to finish up just by acknowledging some people who've had input into the presentation. And I also want to point out, because I saw it last week, um, that the IASIST, which is the International Association of Social Science, something, 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 um, have also just published um, a short um, and pithy guide uh, to data citation, uh, which is even shorter than this. Um, and tells you almost as much. Um, so I'd recommend that to you um, as a useful uh, adjunct to uh, your uh, outreach activities. Thank you.